WNOV 860 and W293C at 106.5 Milwaukee. Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, we're going to debunk some common garden myths so you can have more success in your garden. As well as farmer's markets. Have you ever gone? We're going to discuss what you will look for and need before you travel to one. And we're going to have author of several books, including her newest one, Plants You Can't Kill 101, Stacey Tornio. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. Tell your garden friends that Garden Radio is on the air because it all starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening with over 900 plus garden videos, short, long format, as well as the highlights of podcast replay and in-studio video of this particular show, as well as under the radio tab, you get full-length in-studio videos and podcasts. This program is brought to you every week by great companies that allow us to be here to talk to you. And Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not com- Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. For more information, visit nessella.com. And there's a number of ways in which you can contact us here through the program. You don't have to wait till the last 10 minutes of the program if you've got a garden question. You can contact us at the ivyorganics.com hotline. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. And you can call on any time during the show uh, for your gardening questions at 414-444-5250. You can also tweet us at hashtag TWVG or email us anytime, 365, uh, 24-7-365 at TWVG radio at gmail.com. Well, if you have fall garlic that you planted back in October, before we get in the show, I do want to remind you it's time to cut those garlic scapes or at least look at and see if you need to cut those garlic scapes. If you follow us on Instagram, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, or our Facebook page, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, or on any social media platform, you will see our garden tip yesterday. We do a 60 second garden tip. Uh, most Fridays, and that was the topic of yesterday's, was to cut the garlic scapes, and that's an additional uh, uh, additional thing that you can get off the garlic. You can do a lot of things with the garlic scapes. Uh, pesto, you can dehydrate them, make garlic scape powder, and uh, you can grill them, but uh, you want to cut them off because it's going to put energy into the bulb, so you get larger bulbs and not flowers for seed production, so you want to keep that in mind when it comes to that you know we we find it it's a great honor for us to come into your homes your cars your your ears each week to talk gardening with you and we understand it's a privilege and not a right and and we take great pride in you tuning in each week to listen to us talk about gardening because you obviously want to learn about it or want to be entertained or just have something to listen to and we thank you for doing that uh, so let's get into the main topic of today's program. Back third show that we've ever we ever did here back in March, uh, it was uh, we did two segments on debunking common garden myths, and we thought that it was a time again to debunk more garden myths, common garden myths that uh, many people practice. And the reason why we debunk them is because if we continue to do a practice that has no scientific backing to it. What's the purpose of doing it? You're wasting time, energy, potentially uh, money to do these practices that have no actual proof that they work. 
So we're going to go through part three here of debunking common garden myths, Holly. So what are some common garden myths? Let's just start with a couple of them here. What do we got? So I like this one here where um, we talk about planting a new tree or shrub, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago. With Christy Willingham. Right. Um, you want to dig the hole and add an amendment to the soil before you backfill the, ho the hole. Uh, is that true or false? That is false. Now, if you are growing a tree in 100% clay soil, it's not a bad idea to supplement that backfill, 50% compost, 50% native soil. But a lot of the soil, most of the soil we have, you just backfill it with the original soil. The reason being is if you take a tree, and let's say the tree is in a one-foot pot, you want to dig a hole twice the size of that container. So now you've got a two-foot diameter hole. You plant the tree, you backfill it with compost, and that tree, what that tree has done now is it's reaching its roots out. It finds that compost that you've put in there instead of the native soil, and it just grows in that compost. It continues to wrap roots around. It doesn't go out and explore. Well, this is the same for shrubs and bushes and the whole, all, all types of uh, uh, items like that. What you want to do is by filling it back with native soil or at least a maximum of 50-50 native soil and compost, it's going to allow those roots to go out and explore into the native soil. In addition to that, it's going to have a good foundation. It's going to reach into that soil, which you did not dig up, and it's going to be able to lock itself into the earth and uh, prevent erosion, prevent the tree from topping over or, or uh, uprooting if uh, winds or strong winds come because you've allowed it to grow in the native soil, not backfilled it with uh, organic matter, highly nutrient-rich organic matter. So don't don't do that. That doesn't doesn't work. What's another one? Um, so uh, if a plant is under stress, it should be fed, and that is not necessarily true. Um, a lot of times, if a plant is under stress, it can be other outside factors. It can a lot of times it's lack of water. Right. A lot of times <laughs> it's lack of water. Sometimes, or for the example with uh, zucchini or squash it could be something like the squash vine borer that's eating away at the inside of the plant but again just because you see a plant that's in distress don't put the fertilizer to it because here's what what's happening fertilizer is a mineral minerals contain salt you put more fertilizer around the root of a plant that's already stressed salt dehydrates plants or dehydrates people so it can pull the moisture, what remaining moisture is inside that plant, out of the plant. And we're talking liquid form as well as granular form on that. So you want to uh, essentially here just water the plant on a regular basis based on the requirements of that particular plant. And if it's, if it's not the watering situation, then you need to look into what the problem could be. Right. Just don't think, oh, just pour the fertilizer to it. It'll be fine. That's not going to work. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. You've got to be vigilant on this and actually see what's going on. So just don't put the fertilizer to it because you're wasting money. And like our dwarf lime tree, we see the leaves fall off occasionally. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's not because it's a lack of fertilizer. It's because lime trees or dwarf variety fruit trees, citrus trees, if they are lacking water, they will drop their leaves. Right. So if we would have just kept putting fertilizer to it, we would not have helped the problem at all. All right. So let's talk about um, number five. What's number five, Joey? When it comes to fertilizers and pesticides, if a little is good, twice is better. Yeah, um, that's, that's simply not true. And especially with, well, any fertilizer or pesticide, but it's definitely not true. Yeah, because... Um, so the reason why is that your plant is only going to take up so much of what it needs and you do, don't need to overfill it's going to waste your t money and then on top of that if it's a synthetic fertilizer your plant can easily become very reliant on that on that that fertilizer and also and over fertilizing like christy willingham the the garden garden geek water molecules bond to the synthetic fertilizers right so that and that can create problems into your soil it can create problems into things like runoff and it just becomes a problem. It, it's one small situation that can snowball into a much larger situation. Right. So be cautious of that. Uh, let's see here. Organic pesticides are less toxic than synthetic ones. That's simply not the case. Here's the deal. Yes, they are. There's a standard in which farmers, gardeners follow. It's called OMRI. Uh, the Organic Material, Re what is it? The Organic Re Re Institute, uh, Research Institute, OMRI. 
on these bottles that indicate is that right it's the yeah it's the organic material research institute okay yeah i, I, I thought that was and it is deemed to be certified organic but because if you don't follow the recommended rates on the back of these p uh, chemicals pesticides whatever it is whether it's organic or not it's not safe you can over pesticide over spray something and um, make the problem worse so y you want to follow the recommended rates that's why instructions are on the back of these bottles and, and just like ordinary uh, household safe dish soap if you use too much of that it's considered toxic right so it just because it's labeled organic yes it's an organic practice organic material in the recommended applicational rate that the back of the bottle or bag indicates but over use of that it's just as toxic and, and deadly and bad for the environment and pets pets and your we, kids we're the whole deal. talking about building up your soil and this is and while we do use organic fertilizers and things like that in in our garden you you're well it's helpful building up your soil is what's going to be helpful in the long run organic material of uh, a safe manner yes so drought tolerant plants do not need water this is a very m misconstrued uh, statement you know you, you go to blue Mills, you buy these native plants that it says drought tolerant plant that doesn't mean you never have to water the thing no and especially the first but, year. but I can understand to a new gardener right that makes who's, sense. who's putting landscaping oh I can put this in I never have to water because it it's drought drought tolerant right. and that that does that makes a lot of sense why people would think that but when you're putting that plant in that plant is still young it's still growing and a lot of times that first year it's gonna need consistent watering plants baby plants and or it's seedlings also, it's also adapting to its new ecosystem baby plants or seedlings or starts are very similar to children as an adult you can go a longer time without hydration than a, a six-month-old baby three days well I know but the, the whole the, the, you got to look at it in that well, sense yeah, yeah your body is has the ability to deal with things better than if you are younger just like a plant if a, a four-year-old plant can handle the drought much better than a six-week old plant so I, I look at it that way and then even even after that um, after it's maybe it's been established for a year or two they still they still want water oh Some, yes i mean that's part of life so if if it's been dry they you know you should give them at least a monthly uh soaking so let's talk about this one here vegetable vegetable gardens need sun all day long and i i this is a very common myth people people will say oh i can't grow anything because my patio is in the shade i don't have a field i don't have a field and yes there are Plants that want full sun, such as like tomatoes and peppers and uh, squash, but there's also things that will take less sunlight. So the the saying is that if you grow it for the fruit or the root, you want at least about six hours of sun. Right, more full is sun means six hours. Right, and eight hours is better. Ten hours is great, you're but you need off you need six hours. Right, and then if you grow it for the green, you can have you can plant it in the shade. Well, not completely shade, but you can plant it in partial. less than yeah, partial shade. So there are options for if you don't have full sun, you can certainly grow a lot still. And, and you know, we don't have the in, the intense heat up here in Wisconsin as they do farther south. There's some places in uh, the south and even central the United States where some gardeners actually reduce the amount of sunlight that goes on their garden by using products called shade cloth they build a canopy over top of their gardens to restrict the amount of light because there's so much light that is getting on the garden it actually hurts some of the production of the plants in which they are growing uh, berry banana peels to give roses a potassium boost so banana peels themselves uh, they they can contain a higher level of potassium however you, it does take time to break down that peel and have that potassium released into the soil. So, and once it does break down, that would... Um, it, it's robbing the soil. It's robbing of the, the soil of the nitrogen. The, it's a balance. Everything in when life is a balance. Everything in your soil is a balance. So you have to keep that in mind. So um, you could top dress with a compost instead. Right. Now, that banana peel is best to go in the compost pile. Right. Or just bury it somewhere else, not around a plant in which you're trying to grow. And people, you'll see on, on the internet, and take it for what it's worth, people will take 
old banana pills and let them soak or steep in water for 24 hours to try to extract some of that potassium and nutrients out of it. Just put it in the compost pile and and and, de- uh, and let it break down naturally. That's the best way. If you want a potassium boost, find a fertilizer, either that's uh, immediate, immediately available, water soluble, or uh, it'll break down over 90 days to four months. Uh, that has a high potassium, which is that third number on the fertilizer bag. So we've got a lot. That that's just some of what we have to to debunk. So hopefully we help. Hope that has helped you at least eliminate maybe some of the task in which you normally perform in your garden to save you more time. When we come back, it's all about farmers markets. Have you ever been to one? Well, Holly and I are going to discuss what you need to know before you go and what to look for when you get there, right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. BobX is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. BobX deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. BobX can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit BobX.com. B-O-B-B. Ex.com. I have a growing family and I try to make healthy meals. And one thing I really love about Woodman's is that they have a huge selection of fresh fruits and vegetables. And the quality is really good too. They even carry locally grown produce. And they keep the prices low. So I can stay within my budget and put a healthy meal on the table. I'm Cameron and this is my Woodman. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Hot Chanel, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company. Continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed and more. Even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information, and recipes, visit hotshinmill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show already in progress. We're happy you have joined us today. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. Over 900 plus garden videos, digital magazines, all that. Facebook, Instagram, the whole deal. Well, the whole deal is going to come to Milwaukee in just a few weeks from TreeRipe.com. And you got the email last week indicating that they may not have as many peaches as they were hoping they would have. Right, they had uh, some situation this spring. They, they had a, a late frost. Yeah, late in, frost. Uh, these, these come from Georgia. Right, so you want to keep that in mind that if you are going to go out and get peaches, you want to 
probably get them sooner than later, it sounds like. Uh, and they're not so going to be any less quality, I can tell you that. They're always great quality. Right. So if you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. You can find out where to pick up the top quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have beautiful, tasty peaches and juicy, sweet blueberries. If you're sick of bland, mealy peaches and lackluster blueberries from your local grocer, Tree Ripe has what you need. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck, right from the source. And also, if you don't want to, if you don't want to buy a bushel or half bushel of peaches, you can, they'll be at farmers markets selling smaller. They, they will be. Yes, yeah, smaller okay. portions. And so they have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here, in Wisconsin. Tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around. And we have a shout out we want to acknowledge. Um, yeah, Antoinette. Uh, she messaged uh, or commented underneath the post from the shepherd that i had on the wnov 860 am and fm 106.5 the voice group page uh how she loves the show underneath the uh, post that i put about that we were on uh, in the shepherd uh, a couple of weeks ago and we appreciate her listening to this program and, and all of you well have you ever been to a farmer's market if you haven't there's a number of farmer's markets around we're going to go through items or information that will be very helpful to you and uh, if we would have known before we would have went to our first farmers market it would have helped us as well so let's talk about where, where first of all where can people find where farmers markets are holly because they're like everywhere just throw a rock and you're going to hit one right so there is um there's a few different places one there's this thing called the farm fresh atlas that's floating around I've it's actual paperback yeah, material. Okay. Paper material, and you can find not just farmers markets, but I believe there's like CSAs listed in there where you can find fresh eggs, all sorts of stuff. So that's one option um, where you can find that. Otherwise, if you go to localharvest.org, you can find farmers markets and other fresh farm things. Not even ju not just in Milwaukee. That's just like nationwide. Right. You can find anything from eggs to meat to all sorts of stuff. So that's one as well. Otherwise, you can uh, ask your your friends and family, neighbors. A lot of them know what, where farmers markets are. Otherwise, just a good online search. If most communities have them, they are increasing every year, and so it's definitely something to look into. Um, personally, I know if you're looking for a large farmers market, West Dallas has a, a large one, and. Uh, I'm trying to think of you go else. to Mequon yeah, occasionally. Well, yeah, well, it's in Thingsville. In Thingsville. And then I like the one in Brown Deer, too. So there's, But there's a lot of them. There's some on the east side. They're, they're all over the place. But here's the thing. Farmer's markets are not what the common, ordinary person might think, oh, just vegetables. Right, no. Th there's more than just vegetables on tables at a farmer's market. Right, and it's, it's nice because you can get anything from, you can find the vegetables, obviously, but I've bought tea at farmer's markets. I've... Uh, bought s handmade soap, bread, uh, bread, uh, cheese, dairy. Um, you can some get meats yeah, there as well. You can get meats, grains, um, all sorts of stuff. Even there's even winter farmers markets too. There's like there's one in Milwaukee, and then there's other surrounding area ones as well. So when we go to the farmers market, then this is what I would recommend: before you know what you're kind of have an ideal. Hey, I'm looking for tomatoes or cantaloupe or cabbage, whatever. Have have kind of a list. Because it's just like shopping, you know, at, at the big box store. If you don't really know what you want, you're going to get a lot of things that you may not really be happy at the end because you don't know what you're going to do with them type of thing. But uh, go and see what everybody has before you start grabbing stuff off the first table you see. Start right. look and, and look at prices. Right. Before we get to that. Okay. All right. Let's I want to mention that even if you're going for vegetables or fruit or whatever, something that's uh, produce, and that stuff has generally been picked and harvested that morning. Mm -hmm. And also, you're buying from a local source. The average American meal travels 1,500 miles from farm to, to grocery store. You're cutting that down by uh, 99% yeah. pretty much. <laughs> 1,400, 1,495 miles. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. And so you're getting super fresh produce, which is going to give you the best nutrients. And you're also, you're, it's also not traveling across the country. Okay, so let let we want to look at what everybody has first because two, and you've been there more than I have. Ninety five percent of all the tables there contain ninety nine percent of the same produce. Right. Okay. Right. So we just don't want to walk up. Okay, get out of the car, walk up, grab beets and cabbage and a couple of tomatoes off the very first table. We want to look around because, true enough, all the prices are going to be relatively in the same realm because that's kind of how these farmers markets organizations work. You can't sell beets for $17 and the people next to you sell them for $0.25. Cents. 
there's a range. Well, nobody's gonna, nobody's I know, I know, but there's a range in which there's kind of a recommend. They, they kind of guidelines that hey, you have to kind of be in this kind of parameter to sell. Yeah, you can make money, but you can't gouge people. Right, and that's the thing is that you you can shop around. You also, if you say that you know something fails, a crop fails for you, like. God forbid your tomatoes or something. Or, 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 cabbage, or, or cabbage. Or we don't even try to grow broccoli and cauliflower. Forget right. that. It doesn't work for us. But say you want a lot of that item. Yeah. You can sometimes, you know, say, hey, I, I want X amount. Can you cut me a deal? And, and they'll and, m- more, and more than likely they will, yeah. Or if you're thinking you're, you go there one week and you want a lot of something, you can ask to the, for them to bring it to you next week. And that way you're not going to take their whole and sometimes a- And sometimes they'll say, uh, you, you can say, hey, I'm looking for this much. When you have it, can you give me a call? I'll just come to the farm and pick it up. Right. Uh, and they, and these people are very nice. They want to work with you. They're excited because you're buying locally grown. Majority of it's organic produce. And I bought uh, some flour that way, some sorghum flour. That way I, I went one week and I came back the next week and, and picked it up. And picked up a few pounds of it. But, yeah, so that is, it is definitely an option. And the biggest thing is that if you like to eat organic, you would want – you definitely want to – speak with the farmer about what they're doing how they're growing how they're growing are they growing organically are they using pesticides are they using what kind of fertilizer they're using and and things like that sometimes so they they will have a sign certified organic or organic tradi- uh, transition or they may not even have it at all because that certification though they may be doing 100 percent organic they don't have that certification because it is extremely expensive to get the paperwork to process through the united states department of agriculture and all that stuff. I just I would not go into a farmer's market assuming that everybody's growing organically. Right. And that's def- that's definitely something that you should not assume. But feel free to ask questions. Farmers will talk to you about what they're doing. And with uh, with with that being said, if a farmer and I'm asking you and you know this better than I do, if the farmers market lasts between nine and three, can you get better deals if you go about two thirty, two fifteen as it's getting closer because they're wanting not to bring that produce home? You might be able to negotiate a better deal. I. I've never experienced tried that, so I don't if I'm a farmer, I don't want to bring 15 pounds of beets it back might home. It depends on the, on the farmer, right? Right. But I don't want to bring those back home. I want to be able to get rid of them, sell them at a discounted rate, just because otherwise, if I bring them home, they're not going to do any good. So, yeah, right. I so mean, that, that's an option too. Right. So I want to talk about payment options. Okay. Most of these, most of them want cash. If they're selling, say, like um, I don't know, wooden spoons and homemade handmade cutting boards. They're probably going to have a situation where you can pay with, uh, you know, a, credit a debit card. Right. Card, yeah. But most of the time, if it's just a the produce, they they're t- they're going to take cash. And I know a lot of people don't carry as much cash as they used to, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. So, uh, what do we need to bring besides cash or credit cards? What is there anything else we need to bring? It's good to bring your own bags, for many reasons. A lot of times, those. Those vendors are paying for their own bags. Out there, of the there's pocket. bags there, right? But it's those plastic ones that everybody, you know, they fly around the streets and, it, you know, d- destroy the environment. But right. they, they have bags there. So yeah, bring your own bags and definitely bring some patience, especially if it's a farmers market on a Saturday, or you're there in the evening. There's probably going to be a lot of people. Another thing, if you are gr- trying to grow a sp- specific type of crop, let's say, pick something uh, for us. Let's broccoli. We okay. can't grow broccoli. That's an example that we can use. You can go to a farmer who has a lot of broccoli and ask them, hey, what is your secret in growing broccoli successfully? Because here's how I'm growing it. I can't make it work. They will be more than happy to explain to you some of the procedures in which they practice in order to get their gar- their broccoli to grow successfully. So don't be afraid to ask. Or if you see a... a a fruit or a vegetable in which you're not familiar with, they'll have a label like maybe tiger melons or uh, something of that nature, a yakons or whatever the case is. Ask them what is this and what type of dishes can you use this for? They'll, they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you what you can do it. And sometimes don't they have like recipes on some of these things? Well, uh, they might not have recipes, but you can always ask them how they prepare it or what what it goes well with. Right, because right. Uh, you know they're wanting to to introduce something new into the fold. And they want you to be able to get it and use it um, for your own household and, and cooking, right? Oh, yeah. So wh- if you've ever been to a farmer's market, I would suggest you should take a look at uh, getting or going to one, finding one, figuring out where that is uh, at in your neighborhood. Usually they're not very far. Uh, they're Usually they're, they're not that far away when it comes to... Um, finding 
where you can get one like uh, like Holly said you can search online you can um, uh, find it in that paper a lot of places in which you can get a farmers market and find one and they they come every week in which uh, they're, they're they're weekly there so you can go ahead and get one and go to one and get the produce that you need well there's a lot of uh, produce which you can get at a farmers market but using the tools you need to, to garden is our and use the tools you need to mow grass is important and if you don't have the right piece of equipment to mow grass the job just doesn't work very well and errands can help you with that do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass stained shoes because Aaron is, is about to help you set up your grass cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. Uh, good products, been around in the same zip code for over 80 years. When we come back, Stacy Torno will be with us. She's an author of over 10 books and one of the most popular books she's wrote, Plants You Can't Kill, right after this. Never miss a thing. Sign up for the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener newsletter. Go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on the newsletter box. you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah nasala kombucha makes your body happy nasala kombucha makes your body smile the number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit greenstockgarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non vegetarian. Specialties, 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414-278-7878, and online at beansandbarley.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, 860 AM WNOV and FM 106.5 W293CX. We are so happy you have joined us today. Moments away, Stacy will be with us. About 15 minutes away, your questions on the ivyorganics.com hotline. But first, Blue Mills is the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. And they um, have changed some of their hours to uh, accommodate you and kind of work with, um, with their business. Summer hours have changed uh, for Blue Mills. 
at uh, where's Blue Mills located? So at, first Blue Mills of all? is at forty nine thirty West Loomis Road in Greenfield. They can supply and surpass all of your garden needs. You can go to bluemills.com or call four one four two eight two forty two twenty. They have everything that you need to for all your garden needs. If you're still planting, they have tons of plants. They have the knowledge. It's not just it's not like a big box store where Ray from Paint is working in the garden center. They have very knowledgeable staff. Well, what's wrong with Ray from Paint, by the way? Ray from from Paint doesn't. Doesn't know. Doesn't, doesn't give me <laughs> about your garden plants. He's just there to make his his money and then go home. He doesn't care. Not that I mean, not that they don't pay their employees at Blue Mills, but they have more passion for the uh, the plants and and everything. And then they also have uh, landscaping as well. Uh, yeah, they have uh, master gardeners on hand, and they know what they uh, they know what they're talking about. And they'll talk you out of plants that maybe would not be sufficient for your particular uh, application on your property and uh, it's very very worth well worth the trip in order to find out what they have they still have a lot of stuff available uh, at Blue Mills at uh, at Blue Mills the official garden center 49 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield just south of Layton and that's bluemills.com 414-282 4220. So now we have... Yeah, uh, they, they uh, shift their hours Monday through Saturday. Oh, that's what you were doing. You were looking 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I thought I had it somewhere. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. And then Sunday, they have, uh, they're open 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. They no longer will do delivery bulk to landscape uh, on uh, landscape material on Sundays. So keep that in mind. You can go to bluemills.com for more information. Well, let's go to the ivyorganics.com hotline and bring in our next guest, Holly. Stacy Tornio is originally from Oklahoma, but now is, in the, is a Wisconsin resident. She's a master gardener, a plant enthusiast, and has more than 10 books to her name. She's passionate about getting everyone involved in the garden, including children. One of her most popular books is Plants You Can't Kill. Welcome to the program, Stacy. Thank you, guys. Um, I heard you talking about blue mills. That's like five minutes from my house. Well, there so you go. I'm uh, over on the south side. Yep. Uh, a wonderful facility. Well, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join Holly, myself, and our listeners to share some of your garden knowledge with all of us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, you're very passionate about getting kids into the garden. Uh, we agree with that. We have a niece and a nephew that's very avid. Apparently, uh, they believe that I live in the garden. I'm, I'm not really sure where they get that impression at. <laughs> but why is it important to you to uh, inspire this, or what? why do you inspire this so strongly? You know, I just think it's so important that kids know where things come from. And so, like, knowing where your food comes from, it's, it's shocking how many kids don't realize that, you know, that food is grown from the ground and it's not just from the supermarket. And so it's something, you know, I have two kids, and it's something that I've done with them since they were really little. Like, I'll give them a little space in my garden, and, and I'll say, you know what, you can grow whatever you want in that space. And to give them that little bit of, like, authority has just really worked out really well. They love gardening. It, it, it's helped them kind of take ownership themselves. And, and it teaches them, like, failure, too, because not everything they put in the ground is successful. Oh, for sure. Like, I tell people, like, even if you have a whole packet of carrots and you get, like, three from them, that's still a great lesson for kids. They just realize that that carrot grows and it comes up. And, and sure, maybe they didn't get, you know, 30 or 40 carrots, but it's still a little lesson that they're going to remember. Absolutely. So you use the square foot gardening method, which is a great, a great method. Why do you use that method versus like a traditional row planting? Okay, so I grew up on row planting because um, I grew up in the country where we had huge amount of spaces. And so we had huge gardens, grew everything possible, especially vegetable gardens. And so when I moved to Wisconsin, I've always had more of like a city house, you know. Um, I've had a couple of houses here, and both times I just didn't have the capacity to, to do like row planting. So I started researching more into square foot gardening and have just been so happy with what I can grow in such a a small space. You know, I have like a four by eight square foot garden right now in my yard and I have so much growing in it. Like I tell people like, oh, I'm growing eggplants and herbs and tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers. And they're just like, where are you growing that? Like, you know, they know my house and they're like, how do you have space for that? Um, so it's really cool that I can grow so much in just a little little space. Well, and that's the thing. People are 
uh, they, they reflect on maybe images they see or you know, when they were younger, like you did growing up on the farm, I grew up on a farm as well, that you just put the rows in because we never heard about the square foot garden method and that was just the way things always operated, rows and, and that's the way it happened. Yeah, and I mean, even my mom, who still lives in the same house that I grew up in, like, she does square foot gardening, like, closer to her house, because, you know, the the rows, the farm where we, where we had that space is kind of far away from the house. So she'll do, you know, her traditional garden, but then she'll do square foot up, up close, because it's so convenient. Now, well, let, let's talk about your book here, uh, Plants You Can't Kill 101. When people hear that, uh, their their eyes open up and they perk up a little bit because that's something a lot of people don't want plants to be dying and they want to know what they can't kill. Uh, what are some examples of annuals, not to give too many examples away from the book, what are some examples of annuals that you can't kill? And first of all, what is an annual so we're all on the same page? Yeah, so people kind of tease me about the annual section because they're like, you know, annuals, are supposed to die every year. You know, perennials come back year after year, but annuals, you plant them for one season and then they're kind of done and you have to buy new ones next year. Um, so people have kind of teased me. They're like, you, you wrote a book called Plants You Can't Kill and you have annuals in there. Um, and I just kind of laugh at them a little bit because, yes, we still need annuals. Like, containers, we love to put annuals in containers. We love to just have beautiful, pretty flowers. Um, so some of my favorite annuals that do really well and can last an entire season are like geraniums. Um, geraniums are really good in hot weather. Um, they do good if, it, like, if you forget to water them and you kind of see them wilting a little bit. You can give them more water and they perk up. Um, another of my favorite is cosmos. Um, cosmos are very like a beautiful daisy-like flower. And they do something wonderful called reseeding. And so in one, after the end of one season, the seeds will drop. And a lot of times the next year you will get sprouts and you'll grow more cosmos just from those seeds that, you know, were in the ground over the winter. So in a sense, it's like, yes, it's an annual, but you can get many, many seasons out of it, you know, if you plant cosmos. So people may have limited outdoor space to grow herbs or even just inside space. A lot of people do enjoy growing herbs. What are some herbs you recommend that are, e not, that are easy to grow, not easy to kill, and, ha and don't require a huge time commitment? So a lot of, like, rosemary right away is a good one, and people love the smell of rosemary. Um, so it's a good one that will live for a long time. Um, I always recommend basil to people because it's very easy to grow and it's fun. You can harvest it and make pesto with it. Um, any mint, I mean, mint almost goes into that category of like, if you don't contain it, it can like kind of get away from you and almost be like a little bit invasive. Um, but that's another good one where it's like, especially if you want to make like a summer cocktail or something and, and you want to throw mint in there as well. Um, but all herbs, I would say, you know, keep growing them. Like a lot of times people plant herbs and then, you know, they're halfway into the season and they're like, oh, they're all gone. You know, why, why don't I have more? And so I'll recommend like, you know, if you really like like basil or cilantro, like plant it and then like two weeks later, plant some more and then two weeks later, plant some more. And so that'll really extend your harvest season if you really like a certain herb, but you're finding out that it's, it's ending too soon. And basil, and for the example, mint, it's not just the traditional what we re what we remember. Basil, there's like 15 different basils. Mint, there's like four or five different uh, f chocolate, lemon. Uh, the traditional uh, basil, there's, th uh, there's lemon, lime, cinnamon, licorice, uh, traditional... Uh what do you, and, and uh, I mean, there's so many Thai basil. Thai basil. There's so many different. It's not just that old traditional green mint or basil that we're accustomed to. Right. There's so many, and, and this is where I'll tell people: I'm like, find a garden center where you trust the workers, and ask them. Um, ask them the difference because they should know. Um, and a lot of times, the the other thing I tell people is like, read those labels. Like a lot of times, we're just we're accustomed just kind of speeding through things and not reading the labels and like if you read those labels like they have really good descriptions of like 
how the flavor is different, you know, from the traditional one that you know. So that's another good way to kind of know what you're buying. Is there an, an herb or an herb that you would suggest a new gardener not try to tackle the first year or two until they really understand how, how the plants grow? Is there like one that you say, hey, it's probably not, don't, don't try to grow this one right away. Is there any, any of those on that list? Well, you know, I threw out cilantro a little bit in passing, but that's one that um, can be tricky for a lot of people. Um, and it's like, okay, I, I put cilantro, and then they, it starts to um, it starts to grow too big, and then it turns into coriander, and then it's blooming, and, and so you don't have your cilantro anymore. And that's one where it's like um, you can do it, but it, it's a good one to, like, you know, grow it every, you know, throw some more seeds or throw some more plants in every couple of weeks so that you can kind of harvest that and then move on to the next batch, you know, so you're not kind of disappointed that it came and it went and it's gone and it's over and then you're kind of bummed that it's over. So that's a good one. That's, it's tricky, but you can, you can master it. Great. Now you've written several books. Is there one you like more than the others and why? And where can people find out more information about you? Oh, that's, that's a tough question. So um, the first, one, one of the first books I wrote was a kid's gardening book. Um, and it's called Project Garden. And I, it's kind of near and dear to my heart because I, I did a lot of the photos for it. And it has really great um, project ideas for kids. Like I put some like recipes in there from back in back that are near and dear to me. They're like family recipes, like the family carrot cake recipe is in that book, um, and stuff like that. So, but it's a really good. It's organized by season, actually by month, and so it is a good way to kind of get kids gardening and kind of interested because it has projects throughout that you can kind of flip through it and, and pick something out that you like. Where can people find those books at? Um, so all of my books you can find on Amazon for sure. So that's like some of them are carried locally. Like I know you can get Plants You Can't Kill at Barnes & Noble right now. Um, but then you can find out more about me. I have a website called Destination Nature. And so if you go on destinationnature.com, you can um, learn a little bit more about me. I have some free garden projects and ideas on there, especially for kids. Um, but, yeah, DestinationNature.com is my website. Well, Stacy, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join Holly and myself and sharing your information with not only us but all of our listeners as well. Yeah, thank you, guys. Well, thank you, Stacy. And we'll be back right after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. Have a gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccess.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at MIGardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Mantis Plant Protection Professional Grade Organic Pest Control Solutions. They offer Mantis EC concentrated or ready to use sprays. Certified organic and environmentally friendly insect killer. Gentle on pollinators and other organisms, but effective in killing soft-bodied insects and spider mites fast. Safe around your children and pets. They also have the cleanest and whitest diatomaceous earth on the market. Visit MantisPP.com to receive a free organic pesticide cheat sheet, which is a list of organic insecticides that are used effectively and kill insects fast. Visit mantispp.com to download it today. 
Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, Retail Manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. We are the only garden radio show in Milwaukee, produced in Milwaukee. I know there's a station on the FM side low that pumps in some stuff from Madison. But if you're the only one, can you be number one? Yeah. Okay, so we're the only one, we are number one. So yeah. that, that works. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Berry. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your location for all things gardening, 900 plus videos, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and a whole lot more. If you've got a question, you can certainly call into the IVOrganics.com hotline to have that, ans that question asked, and we will have an answer. Ivy Organic 3-1 Plant Garden naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn insects and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe and organic. For more for information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in at 414-444-5250 with your gardening questions. We had a number of them come in this week through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, we get them from all levels of social media. And uh, Holly, what are a couple of those questions that did come in this week that we can address? So this one is, how do I get rid of earwigs in the soil? Now, this is not a problem we've ever had, but if you do have... Um, they're, they're like a worm that eats the roots of some of these cooler weather crops. Right. So they do... I know it doesn't make sense because we tell you to mulch, but they do like to live under the mulch. But you can take, um, you can trap them by placing rolls of damp newspaper or burlap bags in areas where they are found, and then you can collect them and dispose of them um, also, properly. You can also apply diatomaceous earth for the protection, and you want to remove any gar garbage debris, debris that could cause problems where the earwigs are living. But the diatomaceous earth, that's really good for a, lo a lot of different uh pests in the garden also it may it will help if you plant your crops at the appropriate time that they're supposed to be planted the turnips the rutabagas the radishes the root crops some of those are more susceptible to the earwor earworms uh earwig uh, than the other ones uh what can i this one came on on youtube because of the video we put out this past week uh can i replant radishes now or do i need to wait until fall you want to you want to wait until fall now now the, we're, we're past the point of uh, spring radishes. Right. Now you can um, plant them and make them go to seed right away and eat the green pods. They taste like radishes, uh, the radish bulb. That it, You can do that if you want to do that. We're letting some of our radishes go to seed for that particular reason. And there are some varieties in which they will strictly grow the seed pods for edible consumption and not produce a bulb so you can do that but wait until these take 30 days to reach maturity so wait until uh, it gets cooler and the days get shorter before you go ahead and plant more radishes you can certainly do that in the fall right so the good question here is i have a tomato bed and all the tomatoes have black leaves they are mulched there is no leaves touching the soil i tried a uh, baking soda oil soap spray to combat this uh, possible blight but that just seemed to make it worse um what's going on well, there's a, um, there's a lot of diseases in which your tomato plants are susceptible to without actually seeing. And whenever you have a question about a certain disease or why is my plant doing this, it's always best to send us a photograph at twvgradio at gmail.com uh, with the image because then we can do more. We're, it's a visual thing. I can see it and go, okay, well, I can do some research. Um, if it's only one plant, and I don't have the, the correct answer because there's about 16 different things that can be wrong here. If it's just one plant, go ahead and extract that plant because it may be uh, able to spread to other plants. Right. So that's not... That's the thing is that if you have a specific question about something visual, we kind of have to see it. It's, yeah. it's you can search online right. black leaves on tomatoes and you can come up with a whole bunch of stuff. But until your specific cause may be different than what they are, what you find online. I like this question here, and actually, this is this was Joey's question to our neighbor, who is a uh, horticulturist. 
And it's why are the trees in my yard dropping large section, sections of branches and leaves? Uh, you'll notice this um, on all trees. Now, the reason why this is occurs, and, and I searched out for this because I was asked this, the reason why these trees are dropping large chunks of limbs and foliage is because we had a very wet spring. And what occurs in the tree's growth is the tree sees, feels, knows it's a lot of moisture, going to put on a whole lot of growth. And then it started to dry out. The last four weeks have been relatively dry compared to the previous four weeks. So what that tree does, it naturally selects and drops chunks of limbs. It, it amputates, essentially, what it knows it can't support. So that's totally normal. There's nothing wrong with your tree. Your tree's not diseased. It's simply a balance of the tree. It grew a lot, thought it was going to have a lot of moisture throughout the growing season. Didn't have it, got real dry, started throwing off or dropping limbs that it knew it could not support. So uh, that was a question that I was asked. So I did some research and found out uh, on that one. So that was, uh, that's the reason why. I recently bought a hanging basket. I noticed there are small, round, white egg-shaped looking pieces. What are they? Do I have some kind of bug that has hacked into my hanging basket? No. What those opened miniature egg-looking things are, a lot of these hanging basket uh, manufacturers or growers will uh, put a slow-release pelletized fertilizer in a fertilizer basket. And as you water, the it will bust open that shell or that plastic coating and release that nutrients into the hanging basket. So there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, some of these are organic, some of these are not organic, but that is what it is. It's not a bug that has hatched. It's just fertilizer capsules that have opened up and released the fertilizer into the hanging basket. Okay, so uh, here's one that might be applicable to a lot of people right now. Um, I started my cucumbers from seed on June 4th. They've all came up. They're doing great. Is But my question is I planted three to five seeds in a cluster. All of them came up. Should I thin them out to one, only one plant or is it okay for multiple plants to be in a cluster? You can keep them to about three plants per cluster. You don't really want more than that. I, I, I'm, I'm ta when, when I'm talking a heel or a cluster or a, a gathering, about one square foot, three three is a good balance number that we work with. If you do any more than three, again, remember these plants are tiny, pretty, small right now. They're going to get very large, elaborate, put a lot of growth on, and they're going to pull nutrients from that area in which they're growing. So you don't want to overplant because a lot of that, you know, you're going to hurt the plants because they're going to compete for nutrients. We found that three on good average uh, in uh, fertilized soil works very well. Uh, it does very good in one square foot, three, and you can bind them or you can let them sprawl native on the ground. And then, let's see, can leaves be used around all vegetables as mulch? Absolutely. You can use uh, leaves. Now, if, you're, if your trees, and I'll caution you, if your trees were sprayed with a some type of spray last summer or, or fall, you might want to not use those based on what was sprayed on them. But uh, our trees are all organic. We don't spray any stuff on them. Use them around all vegetables. Uh, you want to avoid using wood chips that you're not certain of the, the origination of them because they could become, they could have come from a diseased tree. And the University of Madison did test and showed that wood chips shredded from trees that were diseased still harbored those diseases a year after the wood chips were created, after the tree was shredded. And some of those diseases are deadly to broadleaf plants, such as eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, and uh, potatoes. So you want to be cautious of using wood chips around as mulch around certain vegetables if you don't know the origination or the, 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 the health of the tree that they were shredded from. And then number um, two there. Oh, yeah. My uh, my wife has planted some zucchini and I have some straw left over for mulch around the tomato plants. Could I mulch around with the straw around the zucchini plants? And absolutely, you can mulch around anything in your garden pretty much with the straw. That's not going to be a problem. Right. Whether you wheat straw, oat straw, barley straw, it's all pretty uh, it's, it's easy to get here. Uh, Blue Mills has straw available and uh, you can still you can use that as a mulch. You can grow in straw bales too, but that straw is perfectly fine. You don't really have to worry about the, 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 there being chemicals on that wheat or on that straw. 
stalk of the plant when it comes to mulching or the um, water perm permeating through that into the soil. A lot of that you don't have to worry about. We're very, um, is not an issue that needs to be concerned with. And again, if you have any questions throughout the week, you can always email us at twvgradio at gmail.com. Or you can tweet us at hashtag twvg. We will see that as well. And do you have anything else? I think that's it. So uh, we always appreciate you uh, tuning in each week. And sponsors make this show possible. That's why we're here every week, and we appreciate your support of the program and your support of the sponsors as well. Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it, because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nasala.com. And join us uh, if you missed any portion of this show or want to revisit this show or past shows. You can find that under the radio tab on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener .com, for full length podcast and in studio video, as well as on the right hand side of the main page, highlights of in studio video and podcast. Tune in next week where we're going to cover alternatives to all purpose flour. All purpose flour, that, that all, all purpose flour is not always the healthiest. To cook with and we're going to go over multiple alternatives of other flowers in which you can use in your cooking and baking applications as well as okra william moss last week said we should all grow okra holly does not like okra but maybe you do and you can grow it here in milwaukee you can go to migardener.com go uh, and get the um, seeds right now june 40 is the coupon code say 40 percent you can do that and we'll get the okra planted next week as well as our good friend and the man who helped us get where we are today with his advice mr joe lample host of growing a greener world on pbs until next week i'm holly baird and i'm joy baird and we will see you in the garden